Good morning, everybody. Yo, you are all coming online, and this is fantastic because, guys, it's Thursday, it's 11 o'clock, and we've got a date. And for those of you who missed the date and are watching it later, hello and welcome. Um, I think all over the country, it's pretty much a typical winter's day. Yeah, I was in Cape Town yesterday, a bit of Miz, a little bit of drizzle, um, a bit cold, a bit cold, guys. Um, and, uh, and here we are where the biggest opportunity in gardening exists. And I say that with full respect. Full respect to understanding that some of you live in areas where it gets really brrr, like minus where you deal with frost, where you have other challenges, but there are ways of getting around that. And that's really what I want to share with you today. Also the opportunities of what you can do if you live in a frost-free zone. And what do we do with the abundance that nature provides? Of course, coming into winter now, guys, if you've got aloes, man, up in the half felt, they are putting on a show of note, of exponential. I, I, I have never seen them looking so amazing. And they're quite early, actually, because, yeah, there's been a bit of a dip. Everything's a bit mixed up, but I'm just glad that they're flowering and they're looking fantastic. Likewise, in the Cape, they've started flowering as well. A long PE all along that belt. They're holding tight. They're holding tight. They're just waiting to push through. And here in KZN, they haven't quite got there yet. But guys, remember, we're always a little bit later, okay, because our cold comes a few weeks later. So certainly by end of May, what are we on today? 21st, 22nd? 18th. Oh, look at me. Oh, well, hello, Tanya. What week are we in? <laughs> so they're coming. But guys, for me, that flurry of, and those beautiful colors that, that aloes represent. And you know, that late afternoon, those late afternoon long rays, long rays of sun, um, that then hit those aloe flowers, and the yellows and the oranges, they burn. They literally burn. It's like, like a halo around them. There, there probably couldn't be anything more beautiful. Um, and remember, aloes are not only meant for big gardens. If you go along to your local builders now, you will find all these little guys. And you're like, well, what are you going to grow into? A big guy? These are the hybrid aloes that have been developed and selected, not through any genetic manipulation. No, 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 no. Just selected. So there was one like short guy in the family. You know how it goes. You know, like all the brothers are tall and then this thing pops out. So what they did was they took that and they bred it and they made brothers and sisters from it. And now we have the most amazing selection of what we call hybrid aloes. The other interesting thing about these hybrid aloes is that most of them don't have thorns. Yeah, you can literally just grab it and touch the leaves and they don't have thorns, but they have amazing flowers. Um, on some of the little hybrids, you can get up to 30 spikes pushing through 60 70 80 flower heads because they multiple um, just insane so for containers for little pathways on the edges of beds they insane so guys if you haven't done that allo allo thing in your garden go out and do it because completely spectacular it it really is a welcoming of the seasons and uh and for me that dispels a whole lot of goodness in the garden. Um, so before we get going on there, let's see who's here. Um, I saw a few of you, oh, you know, this computer of mine, I just love it and hate it at the same time. But anyway, never mind. Here we go. Ah, good morning from Mozambique. Nampelo. Oh my goodness. I don't think we've had somebody from Mozambique. Oh, I still want to go on holiday there. Oh, I really do. Um, but anyway, that's another story. If you know of any good spots, you can let me know. Um, Gazelle, good morning. Um, oh, you've got a long question there. Okay, but I'm sure we'll get to that just now. 
Um, good morning, homemade by Sibo. Sibo, I hope I'm saying that. Good morning from Paris. Not Paris, but Paris in the free state. Good morning. Oh, lovely, lovely, lovely part of the world. Um, oh, gazelles from New Zealand. Oh, genus. Um, goeiemorgen. Verstaan jy wat ek nou sê? Ek kan nie mooi, ek, ek kan nie vloek nie, want ek mag nie, maar ek sê hallo en welkom. Welkom na die Builders Live. Um, Geraldine, good morning from Pretoria. Good morning, Shirley from Bryanston and Joburg. Um, uh, I'm going to give you your answer to your question just now. Um, Renata, good morning from Wingard. Oh, I could say that word terribly. Wingard Park. Yeah. Wind, wind, Wingha. Wingard. Yeah. Wingate Park, Pretoria. Help me with that. Um, Patricia, winter has arrived with a bang here in Joburg. Oh, yes, yes. Pat Brown, good morning from Cape Town. Uh, Renata, I've said good morning. Maureen, good morning to you. Um, Mintez, good morning. Beverly, what morning from Benoni. Tian, oh, hello. Hello, beautiful. Um, did you get married? Oh, is it not, not? Other tier. This is another tier. Good morning from sunny Thunderbale Park. Um, oh, you've got a question which I am going to answer now. Um, are you ever coming to builders around that side, Thunderbale Park, to do a talk, a live? Well, guys, we have firmed up all the dates for the builders lives. Um, what we call the builders road show, uh, where you get to spend like two hours besides yummy things lots of giveaways, and we get to talk gardening. Um, we've just finalized those dates, and they're going to be up on the Builders page and also on the Gardeners and Tanya Fissers page, that's on Facebook, um, in the next few weeks. So, guys, keep an eye out there and make sure you book your spot at your local Builders. Okay, I'm very, very excited about that. Um, Kim, good morning. Um, met you at Builders Glen Eagles. Uh, hoping you'll come back and give another talk. Uh, I, I hope so too, but I'm going to be all around the country and um, we really hope to add so much fun, hey? It's so much fun. Um, uh, Lynn, good morning. And who else? Viz, good morning. Tanya from a cold Durban, good morning. Atlantic Fertilizers, Mwah! good morning, good morning. Um, I hope you ate all of the goodies. Mm. Mm. I'm saying no more. No more. Uh, <laughs> uh, right, guys, let's get into it. So, um, oh, I've got to dry mouth here. I'm getting too excited. Mm -mm -mm -mm. So, as you can see, exhibit A on my right, um, this is where the entire studio has been turned into the most beautiful winter scene. And uh, and what is that? It's leaves. Oh, guys, um, but I need to just grab this and this and just drag it along with me, first of all. Now, um, now folks, we, we get this, okay? And and a lot of you are going to, to have lots and lots of beautiful fallen leaves. Um, and some of you curse it. And... And I'm like, you have no idea what a gift this is. This is a gift from nature. Um, and whether you've got evergreen trees or whether you've got the deciduous trees that lose all of their leaves now or might have fallen, they're lying all over your lawn. Um, you know, if you're a bit twitchy about it, um, just take another pill and embrace it. Because what you are being given here is literally the most amazing gift. So, besides getting to play in it <laughs> and all the other uses of beautiful leaves, of course, importantly, we can use them as mulch. There are so many, so, so many other uses that can be used, and we're going to touch on that in a second. But what I want to tell you about what happens here. So the leaves start turning, okay? And on some of the maples and on some of the, the deciduous trees, we get to see the most beautiful colors. 
And there's a process happening. There's a chemical process that's happening in nature. But when these leaves fall, okay, and, and they're now fallen on the ground, there is an important chemical. It's a complex acid that is in these leaves that becomes activated. And this is called fulvic acid. Now, you've heard about that word. You've heard about fulvic acid and how important it is for soil and for plant health. Now, what happens is that this fulvic acid in the leaves starts being released. Of course, yes, it starts being released because the leaves are now on the ground or they've been used as mulch. And it gets released where, by the moisture, of course, the moisture from the soil. When that happens, this complex acid then attracts iron. Oh, okay, yeah, iron. And we know how important iron is for plants. So it actually attracts the iron, brings it up to the surface, so these molecules can now become available for our plants. So not only are we mulching, which we know is so important because it's feeding, it stops the weeds, it also helps as a little blanket. You know, like your little electric blanket that you're probably going to be switching on. Um, or when you put a little blankie over your knees, it's thin, but it keeps them so warm. And this layer that we put on the soil insulates the soil, protects the microbes, feeds it, does so many important things, which I cannot urge you enough just to do. If there's one thing I will say over and over and over again to every gardener in the world, not even in South Africa, is mulch. Much more mulch. Do not throw away the leaves, guys. Please do not. Um, but getting back to that, that iron, that iron, okay, and that process where the fulvic acid, okay, then pulls up the iron is called chelation. All right, that's the process. It's called chelation. Why am I telling you about this? Because what is so interesting and important is that that chelation eventually. It ends up through the waterways. Yeah, you remember the story. Remember when we were in school, we had a draw like the rain went up or the water droplets into the clouds, then it came down, then it went through the rivers, and then it ended up in the sea. You remember that drawing? Yeah, you remember that, of course. So that fulvic acid, okay, which has now got the iron, goes all the way in and ends up in the oceans. And do you know what it happens there? It is the most important, major source of nutrition for phytoplankton. Mm. That's what they eat. And it starts from leaves. Come on, guys. Ha! Yeah, I love it. I think David Attenborough might be proud of me for that moment. But anyway, he is my hero, by the way. And he turned, nine, was it 97? 97, it was his 97th birthday last week. Oh, <sighs> insane, insane. Okay, so what do we do with all these leaves? Well, there are different ways that we can deal with it. And of course, probably one of the, the ways that most of you would do would put it into a black bag. Now, yes, you can do that. You're gonna put it onto the compost heap and I'm gonna get to that and what you're gonna do with it. Um, of course, you can make something very important out of these leaves, very, very important, okay? And that is called a leaf mulch, okay? Um, and if you uh, wanna know how to make that, check out the Builder's blog because we have got an awesome clip that tells you how to turn these things into something that literally is amazing. It's called leaf mold, okay? So go onto the Builder's blog and search leaf mold. How do we make that and what do we do with it? But this, this bag here, this bag, ho, 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 ho. Um, I mean, I collect them. I, I've got a pile behind the woodshed. Um, and if anybody touches those bags, they will get a severe, severe rake, metal rake used against them. Um, because you cannot touch them because that is the important stuff. Okay, so let's talk about, now, how do we do it? Old fashioned ways, guys, of course, it's about rakes. Now. There's a whole lot of things that, that I want to tell you, first of all, about rakes, is that, number one, most of us use the wrong rake for the wrong thing, okay? So we've got one of these. Most of you will have one of these, and 
<laughs> I do urge you um, to go and inspect it. Because <laughs> most times, you see these little little fingers, the little forks? Well, it's been used so much that it's now just, just like, it's just those things. There are no longer these things here. Come on, these guys are like so inexpensive. Um, just, just go and get a new one, okay? Because these little tines that are here are here for a reason. Okay, so that is the one. This is called a leaf rake. A leaf rake. Okay, and then we get the metal rake. Now, this is where things get confusing. This is where people use the wrong thing. Now, this metal rake is used to level soil, okay, to level soil and to get rid of big clods in the soil, um, especially when preparing beds. And you can see what you could use it for. I mean, you could literally use it across here. I love using a rake, a metal rake, that way. When I am leveling beds before sewing, turn the rake that way. And then you just pull it gently across the surface and you get the best levels that you could ever get. You also use it like that just to break up the clods. Okay, much easier because we do all end up with that um, in, in the soil when we're prepping it and when we're turning it. Okay, so what do you not use this for? You do not use this to try and rake the lawn. Negative. You are going to rip up the lawn. Negative. You do not use it for that. Neither do you use it for raking leaves. That's why this is called a leaf rake. Okay, and very simple. You can see, nice and effective. Okay, and you can rake up the leaves. Um, guys, and, and it sounds so simple. It, it, honestly, it sounds like really, really simple stuff. But honestly, this is what this thing is used for. Another little trick that I really do enjoy doing, and by the way, I have just pulled this off, but you can, it just screws back on, is you, you see there's got a little thread, okay? It just screws back on there. And another little thing that I like doing is to have two leaf rakes. Never mind that. You have two of them. So pop it into your hand like that, all right? You've got your other one here. Ah, ah, you're with me. And all we do is this. So we've got two leaf rakes, the heads, and you can just pick it up. So easy. Do you see? So easy. Okay, so that's the other use for a leaf rake or maybe a fan. Not very effective, um, but anyway. Okay, so those are the rakes. Let's put this baby back here. Um, and you can stand up there. Okay, so now we've got all of these. That's great. We've collected all the leaves. Life is good. What do we do with them now? So you're going to go and check out the video on how to make leaf mold, 100%. But there are other options that can make our life a whole lot easier. And that, my friends, is when we come to these things. Okay, <laughs> look, 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 look at this baby. Look at this baby. Okay, yeah, now, now, now guys, if you know me, you know that any gadget in the garden is like, <laughs> to me, you cannot have enough gadgets. Okay, so this is a shredder. Now guys, the, the, the shredder, this is an electric shredder. Um, the cord does not come with it, okay, so you've got to buy the cord. Um, but remember, during winter, what other tasks are we doing? Yeah, we're thinning our trees. We are lifting the canopies of trees. We're doing some pruning, okay? And with all of that, we're gonna have a whole lot of stuff. And if you're anything like me, when you start pruning, boy, I get pruning fever. Oh man, it hits me like island fever. And pruning fever, before I know it, I'm like, oh, that pile just got bigger. You know, it's a thing, it's like, I don't know, and it's great exercise and it's, it's fabulous. It's absolutely fabulous, but then I gotta get rid of all the stuff. And that's when we use one of these guys. Okay, so this is a Ryobi garden shredder, okay. It's got large wheels at the back that are very sturdy, so you can wheel it in and out of place, okay. Um, it's got this little guy over here, basically, so you put the things in here and the shreddings come out here, so you've got a bag that you can literally just pick it up and move it away with. The blades inside here are reversible, which means that when it gets a bit blunt, you can just 
undo it, turn it around, and then you've got sharpened blades, which is fantastic. It's a very, very powerful. This is a 2,500 watt, okay? Um, and most importantly, is also about storage. Guys, it's very important. Don't leave this guy outside so the rain drips inside here and then could cause those blades to rust. Um, what I do is, is, in actual fact, I go to the patio section at Builders and I head to left. There where all the covers are. You know you can buy a cover for everything, a cover for your mother-in-law. Those, those, those like green things for the Weber. I get a Weber cover and the Weber cover I put over this, okay, which means that it can stay outside and when I want to use it, it's right there. Make gardening easy because if you've got to get it out from the back of the garage in front of the car that you might scratch or you have to reverse it out, you're over it. I get it. I get it. So make it easy easy for you very important guys very very important and you know they even put it stick it on you come look here mace just come and close over here they say maximum cutting here 45 millimeters and they say do not put your hand in here okay that's like like hello now don't be doff okay are you also not removing you're also not going to be shredding entire trees okay that you will get a chainsaw for or a saw that you can then cut them up keep it for firewood but certainly up to 45 mils straight in remember thinner ones thinner ones that you need to feed in you use this paddle okay this paddle is also when you've been called in when it's dark and you're still shredding and you need to and you need to chase away the person that's calling you in then you just you just hit them with this thing. It's lovely. I mean, check that. Lacquer. Okay. So that you feed it in. You do not feed it in with your hands, guys. You feed it in. Folks, I mean, Mother's Day is come and gone, but I would, I would give myself another Mother's Day present. Um, Father's Day is coming up. That's in June. Make up a birthday. Make up a day. Anything. Make an announcement on Facebook. It's my birthday or something. And then change the date. But you really need one of these. Okay. All right, so that's that. How else do we get rid of it? Oh, okay, okay. Oh, a blower. Now, i got to tell you guys, blowers in, in our household, um, we can never have too many. We simply just love them. This is a, a Ryobi blower. Um, it works on a battery. So it has the charger. What's important about this battery is that it is a universal battery. It fits all of the Ryobi tools. Whether it's a drill, whether it's a blower, whether it's um, a jigsaw, it fits all of them. It's the, it's the one plus range or something, I think it's called, that thing. Anyway, it fits everything. Okay, so very simply, keep it charged, pop it in here, okay. Um, there it is. Nice, it can tell you, is it charged? Yes. Okay. See? It tells you it's charged. Okay. Uh, you can detach this. Um, if you want to do some serious blowing, you can just pop it there and you can detach. Um, what do they call this thing? It's a tube. They detach the tube. But for collecting leaves, and it is a bit of an art, guys. You've got to practice a bit um, in how to move the leaves. And ideally, you want to move the leaves into one corner. And then from there, you want to be able to pick them up. Okay. And pick them up using the methods that I've shown you. But... Uh, but let's play, let's play a little bit because this is an amazing tool. And I'll tell you what else we use it for. <laughs> uh, we use it on the patio just to get rid of a bit of dust, you know. If the dogs have been running up and down the grass and they've bought grass clippings um, onto you, just you just do it like, you just hoi this thing. Um, uh, there are many, many uses for a blower. The dogs love it because they think we're playing a game with them and they actually come in and when I turn this thing on, maybe Ari will actually wake up because she's lying in the bed at the back there snoozing. But uh, this is a... So, it, you know, you can control. You can move the leaves exactly to where you want them. Okay, and... and Right now, I'm surrounding the cameraman, um, but that 
That is the idea. The idea is that you move them into a section, whether it's into a corner. Ari, come, wake up. Ari, come see. Um, uh, Rolo loves, Rolo also loves uh, the blower. And guys, our house cannot, our household could not exist with one of these. And you see what I'm saying? Like in here, have a look here. This was your patio. You'd got some dust or something there. Oh, look, she's gone. Brilliant. Okay, so make up a day, make up a day and, and give yourself a birthday present, uh, whatever it is, but, uh, but you've got to have one of those. Mm. <laughs> okay, so now that we've collected all those, we've made some mulch. Of course, we've got a lot of extra. What are we going to do with it? Well, guys, yes, you are going to compost. Compost, compost, compost. So don't tell me that you don't have space or whatever because you can pick up one of these little guys and they work brilliantly. All you need is a solid surface. You can put it straight onto the ground, okay? You can. Or if you're worried about that, you can just put a bit of weed guard, okay, underneath it. Put all your stuff in there. Remember, in order to get compost working and your compost activated, there's no magic in this because it's all free. It's hohos. It's the hohos that break it down, okay, the microbes. If you want to speed it up a bit, then you grab yourself some of this. It's a little packet of stuff which has got millions and millions and millions of live little microbes. And all you do is you drop the sachet into some lukewarm water. Lukewarm, because remember the lukewarm makes them come alive, like yeast. Yes, like yeast, like when you're baking. You put the little cube in and then lukewarm water, and then they like start like waking up. And that's how you do it, lukewarm water. And then you put it into this. This one little sachet can do up to a ton of compost. That's insane. It's like insane. Okay, right. So the do's and don'ts of composting, guys, very, very simple. Remember, compost heaps are vegetarians. Okay, they are vegetarians. They do not want meat. They do not want dairy products. They do not want any raw meat. Okay, fish included. In terms of the do's and don'ts of composting, guys, we have got an amazing, very detailed blog and video on how to get the most out of your composting and other solutions. So all the do's and don'ts, um, I'm literally just touching on a few of them here, but if you want more detail on that, please go and check that out. Okay, so what can you put into the compost heap? Well, this is, this is from our compost heap. Okay, yeah, you see, there we go. There's a, a roller towel. Um, there's some onion. Uh, oh, there's some eggshells, some leaves, some potato skins. That all goes in here and you seal it up. Okay? Um, remember what's important with composting. And of course, the leaves. What's very, very important with composting, and this is the only, this is really, really the beginning and the end of it, is your ratio of brown to green. Now, your brown to green, brown is like this. Okay, brown makes sense. Green, we refer to, it needs to still. It's, it's got mushiness in it, it's got moisture. Yes, moisture, like the potato skin, um, like the onion skins, okay? They've still got moisture. You want at least two thirds brown to one third green. Okay, you got that. If your compost heap starts smelling and it's a bit mushy and you don't have leaves, just tear up some um, cardboard. Tear up some cardboard, throw that in there, okay? And it really helps. It'll also get that balance right. And that's so, so important. That's one of the biggest failings um, of, of composting. Of course, what do we do with the meat and the, and the leftover um, fish and, and dairy and that bit of yogurt that you didn't want to eat? And what do you do with it? Well, you give that to your bokashi. Um, bokashi is insane. Um, we have about three bins going because you fill it, fill it, fill it with all those things that you can't put in the compost heap. All the things you can't. And then you add some of this bran, which is also activated with a ho ho. But this ho ho, this ho ho, it eats leftover bits of steak, it eats fat, it eats bones. 
um, I'm still looking for a bin big enough to take human beings. Yeah. Now I sound like Hannibal. Terrible! But it's the most amazing process that you can put that stuff in there and then there's a tap at the bottom here and this liquid comes out and you open up that liquid, you dilute it into water and you have got free plant food, guys. Free plant food. Luck. Hello. Come on. What's the problem? Okay. Uh, it, it's completely amazing. Come and have a look closer up here. This is, this is compost. Look at this from our compost heap. I mean, isn't that beautiful? Look at that. Friable. Oh, I wish you could smell it. This is beautiful stuff. And you can see there's a bit of an eggshell that was still there. Um, but this is the stuff of champions. This is the stuff that makes good gardens great and makes your plants so incredibly happy. So please, guys, come on. Come on, make your own compost. It, it, it's beautiful, it's inexpensive. Uh, get your, get the basics. Basics, guys, come on, just simple basics. All right, so that's Bokashi composting. Um, and of course, you could also buy your bag of compost um, at your local builders. But you know, while get your compost bin going, Okay, and then you get your few bags and then you've got your own compost after that. Okay, next thing you'll be sitting on the side of the road and selling your bags of compost. Uh, remember during winter when it does get a bit drier, I would encourage you to actually water your compost heap. Okay, add a bit of water. You can do that like well, once a month. Just take the hose pipe, pop a bit in because a compost heap should also not be too dry. Okay, which is also important. Okay, so now. What else? What else? What else? We've done with all of that. What about, what about colour? What about colour and what are the opportunities that exist right now that we can put into our gardens to make sure that we have amazing, beautiful, colourful gardens? Well, guys, it's not too late to still plant your bulbs. So remember, um, we have done lots on bulbs. And if you are uncertain, once again, we have got some amazing videos that teach you what to do with the bulbs and how to get the most of them. But plant them. The instructions are all on the back. Plant them close, plant them tight, put them in pots, um, put them on the edges of paths. You could even pop them into the lawn. <laughs> and now there is something quite fun. Uh, but guys, still put them in now. You've still got time because they flower late winter, early spring to give you this burst and really to, to welcome and herald spring coming in. So I'm often asked about seed sowing. Can we still sow seeds now? Is it too cold? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes, you can. The answer is yes, you can. Now, if you live in a frost-free zone, in a frost-free zone, guys, there is still lots that you can sow, lots. So any of your brassicas, all right, so that's your broccolis, your cabbage. Um, in fact, it's the best time to be able to sow those. Peppers, you can still do. Mustards, hollyhocks are amazing. Marigolds, which you will then plant in between your veg to help with the hohos. Um, tomatoes. Winter in the subtropics, subtropics, coastal areas, frost-free areas, it's probably your best time to, to grow tomatoes. The best time, because you really have the best chance to be able to harvest them. And I will tell you this, that when you have eaten a tomato from your own plant that you have harvested, especially if it's been a warm day, and you pick that tomato off, you will question yourself as to what you have been eating or slicing up that was red, that came out of a packet that you bought. Because it tasted nothing like that one. Mm. Okay, so if you are in a frost area, guys, there are a couple of things that we've got to do just to kind of get over, get over the hump and, and deal with the cold. So in terms of sowing, yes, you can sow. Um, and there are loads, loads, loads. And this also goes in terms of the subtropics. So, so I'm just adding to the list now. So it's pansies, it's sweet peas still. Um, it is alisum. 
oh, calendulas are beautiful for color. And remember, you can also eat the flowers, the petals. Um, wild rocket, your beetroots. There's your Brussels sprouts, your beets. Lobelia, turnips, and of course, Swiss chard. But guys, if you are worried and you want to get them going quicker, all right? It is important for me, and I would strongly recommend this, that those seeds you take and you sow either into trays, okay, like this, all right? So you sow them into trays, all right? And we've shown you seed sowing. We've shown you how to do it. Sow it into trays. And remember, you're going to use a block of this amazing stuff called palm peat, all right? And the palm peat is this stuff down here, okay? That basically you just add some water to it and it decomposes into this beautiful stuff that holds moisture. So we sow directly into the palm peat. Um, leave it in a container like this because if you don't use it all, um, you just keep it there and you just apply some moisture to it when you need to reuse it again. So either into that, but there's so many options. They're these cute little guys and I quite like these because look, that is made out of cardboard. Okay, so you sow your seeds. This is where I imagine, this, well, what we use it for is bigger things. So whether it be broad beans or whether it be beetroot or cabbages or sweet peas, put your bigger things in here because then when it's ready, you just tear that off, tear it off, and you plant it directly into the soil. So there's no transplant shock. But once you've sown, guys, get yourself one of these. It's a little mini greenhouse. Um, they're available at your local builders. They work like a bomb. Um, and if you want quick germination, and especially if you're in a very, very cold area, remember, keep this in a well-lit area. And you've got the vents, which you will only open the vents once the seeds have germinated. So you will water, okay? You will sow, you will water, you will close the vents, and you will then wait because this forms, yep, that picture that I told you about earlier, the droplets coming to the top, into the clouds, dropping back down, that's what you create in here. And of course, warmth, because it's here. They'll germinate from there, you can prick them out, pop them out into little containers like this, um, make your own, which could be out of um, toilet rolls, the scent of the toilet rolls, which we call a foo-foo, they can also then get put into, you can make your own little newspaper pots. Yes. And from there, straight into the garden because it all just breaks down. All right. So do it, guys. Do it. Of course. And then you could buy like the instant things like this. Um, so in terms of what are my options? I'm like, come on, guys. There are so many options. Um, this is also something that I really, really do want to show you. And uh, let's go up around over here. Um, guys, so when you are sowing your seed and then you are going to attempt to water them, you need to get yourself one of these little things, the set of these three. They're fabulous, okay? You buy three, three in one little packet, okay? You can put it onto this little one and a half litre bottle or this two litre bottle and they're different nozzles. Um, I really, really prefer the smallest one, but you can see it goes on quite easy. It goes onto the smaller bottle or the larger bottle. You see there? There. What goes on here and if we are sowing and we are watering young seed that is just germinated so the little seedlings um, then I would really suggest that you use this and the reason why is because imagine if these little guys were much much smaller in fact I've got some over here take a look here you see here they are these were sewn directly into these, okay, not into the trays. They were sewn directly into these, and they were germinated in the propagator, all right? And in terms of watering, oh, look, nice and easy, okay, nice and easy. And then from here, when they are big enough, and these guys probably just need another week, I want, do you see that leaf and that leaf? I want those two leaves to get 
almost the same size as that. That's what we call four leaf mature stage. When we get that, I know that these guys are tough enough to get planted out. Okay, very, very important because this is when disaster can happen. It's when we transplant too early or we transplant too late. Okay, so, right. Next up, borage. Guys, find borage, sow borage seed, and it grows so easily. Borage is one of those that are so forgiving that you can take the packet of seed and literally think you're Mary Poppins and just throw it in the garden, um, and it will come up. But borage is great in the winter months. It is fantastic. It has blue flowers, which are edible. Um, it's a great companion. And importantly, these leaves, these leaves are great for composting. And the other one that's excellent for composting is, of course, comfrey. Take the comfrey leaves, add them to your compost heap, use them as a mulch. You can even make your own comfrey tea. Okay, not to drink, but for your flowers. Um, but this is like a must. We just love it in the garden. The bees, the bees like going to this like frenzied ha. They're like, yeah, dude. Okay, Maya's looking for whoever his friend is. It's like, they love it. They just love it, love it, love it. Um, when you're thinking of things and when winter comes to mind, it's a great time to get your fruit trees in. It is one of the best times. Get your fruit trees in, get them established. And remember their simple planting rules, guys. Follow them. Double the depth, double the width. Use your compost. Get your plant food in and give them a good, good watering once a week. But get your citrus in. Um, and you can't only have one lemon tree. I mean, that's a negative. You cannot. You need at least two. All right. At least two. Um, oh, and if you're worried about your citrus and um, what to plant, how to look after it, what are the hohos, what are the bubbles coming on my leaves, never fear because in the next live that we're doing, um, on this exact platform is going to be all about citrus. So we'll answer all your dramas and problems and I'll be your agony aunt for your citrus. Okay. What other options do we have for winter, guys? Oh, man. It's endless. It really, really is endless. And for me, it's about color. It's about beautiful chesachis. It's pansies. These, I mean, look at them. Look, it's like velvet. With that little yellow eye in there. I mean, and these guys are incredibly tough. Um, so these are little violas. Of course, you can go for the bigger ones, which are the pansies. Uh, but these guys will go on and flower right through. Sometimes even through until January in your garden, if you plant them now. All that's important, very, very important, is that when it's finished flowering, you see that guy, it's finished flowering. He's on his way out, thumb and forefinger, and all I want you to do is get in there, nip it off, and that's what we call deadheading. Very important, because of course after flowers come seed. We're not interested in the seed, okay? We want flowers, we want flowers. And instead of the plant putting all its energy into the stalk, by removing these spent flowers, the plant now puts all its energy into producing more, which is just what we want. Okay, so that's the pansies, the viola, snapdragons. Ach, nie kom kein liubekis. Just, they're so cute. I just want to squash them. Um, the little liubekis are so cute. Look, 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 little snapdragons. Now, most of the snapdragons that you're going to have and, and that are available at your local builders are... Oh, here he is. Come, wait, 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 come. Good morning. Hello. They are the dwarf varieties, so they don't get more than 30 centimeters maximum. Um, beautiful colors, bright pinks, bright yellows. Uh, just insane. I, I love them. And you buy them like this in flower, pop them in, and they just carry on going. Primulas, petunias, poppies, uh, Lobelia, beautiful gazanias, 
that love the full sun, don't need a lot of water. The bees just adore them. Um, I can't forget all that pollen that's just come off on my finger. Uh, that's what the opportunities are that exist right now in winter. So, 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 so many. Um, and our gardens are literally crying out for them. Literally crying out. But I know there's another thing that might be crying now. Out for some help. And that's probably your lawn. You've noticed that you've cut down on how often you're mowing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, I got you. All right. And, uh, but you also know, and you've got in the back of your mind, like things are about to go pear. All right. They're about to go pear. So I've got a little video that I want to show you on how to just get you and your lawn over this hump, which we call winter, which has provided us with all this amazing color um, and leaves till we get to spring. Take a look. Here are three tips that can help you and your lawn get through winter. Number one, the most common effect that we see during the winter months is where our grass turns brown. It starts dying off. Now it's not literally dying off, it's simply going to sleep. Certain grass varieties like Kukuyu and Cynodon will go brown and there's nothing that we can do to stop that. However, what we can do is make sure that they are best prepared before going into the dormancy period. The dormancy is caused through the drop in temperature when the plants literally go to sleep because grass is a plant. So the first thing to do to get your grass prepared for winter is to make sure that you've given it its good last feeding. When it comes to feeding, there are various options. This one here is an organic option. It's called Bioorganic for Lawns, and it's simply applied by using 50 to 100 grams per square meter applied over the lawn. This is a chemical option known as 713. It's 30 to 40 grams per square meter, and it must be watered in well. Either of these are going to provide your lawn with the correct nutrition to beef it up before the cold winter. The reason for your last feeding just before winter is also to thicken up the lawn. If your lawn has been under any stress during the summer months, it's important to get it at its peak growing performance simply before the long sleep. So by providing the right nutrition, we're thickening up the lawn, getting it strong and healthy, ready for the cold winter dormancy. When applying your fertilizer, it's always a good tip to start from one side, work your way across systematically, and alternately, then turn around and zip back. It just makes it so much easier in terms of controlling the square meterage that you're applying to. Remember, with an organic fertilizer, you don't actually need to water, but it is a good tip to water because it just gets into the garden, into the lawn a bit quicker. When using a chemical fertilizer, even if it is a slow release product, it is important to give your lawn a really good watering. For lawns which remain green during the winter, Berea Shade, Kersney, Buffalo, one way of reducing the stress during the winter months is by lifting the mowing height. And that way, the lawn is far less stressed as to a shorter lawn, and it really does help it getting through those colder winter months. And the third way of protecting your lawn during the winter is to change animal and human behavior. Now this might sound quite strange, but a simple pathway as you saw me walking can get really trodden, compacted during the winter months, especially if you're in the winter rainfall areas. In the summer rainfall areas, it becomes dried out, the soil gets very compacted and the roots actually die. It's when the roots die and you have no foliage that's when things go wrong. So the best way of dealing with that is to change the behavior by using small little picket fences or making your own by changing the direction of where the animals and humans walk can just alleviate the pressure and the stress in that area. Once it recovers, flip it over and the path can continue and the lawn will be happy. Well, there are three ways that can help you and your lawn get through the long winter. Remember, everything I've used is available at Builders, either in-store or online. Visit the blog and check out the website for great videos, more DIYs and interesting hints and tips to turn you into a green-fingered guru. Get to Builders and get it done. <laughs>
Alrighty, so there are the three tips on how you can solve the lawn dilemma over the winter months. Guys, of course, everything that we're planting, we need to make sure that we're giving it the best chance. So when you are planting, preparing your soil, there are many, many options. Bone meal in the planting hole or bone meal sprinkled over the area that you are preparing and digging over to sow your seeds, okay? Bio Ocean, which is an organic product that simply, depending on if you're planting or if you're feeding the instructions, are all on the back, guys, but this stuff has got some seaweed in it, which gives it a bit of an extra boom. Over here for flowering and fruit, so this would be to feed your fruit trees, okay? All right. There are so many options, but get out there and just give them some food, guys, please. Um, remember, your organic products, because they are pelletalized, are going to release slowly. As you water them, they swell, okay? They then swell, and so the nutrition is then released nice and slowly. So your fruit and flower, which is this guy, the purple writing, has a bit of extra potassium what is potassium okay what is potassium you got it potassium is for flowers okay flowers and fruit yes which is why i said give that to your fruit trees okay and all these other things that i've spoken about okay your flowering plants your bedding plants put that around when preparing your soil as well for planting you can use it right there um guys uh, I see there are a lot of questions that have come through, so we're going to jump straight to it. Um, let me get to here, and, and guys, let's answer them as we are going. Um, Angie asks, Atanya, what, <laughs> uh, what is the best way to get rid of moles? I get my neighbor to send their leaves over... What? Oh, I get my neighbor to send their leaves over the wall into my... Oh, I love that. Have you got a fluffy slide? Do you know that they like put the bag in? You know, I... I can see that. I can see that happening. Okay, how do you get rid of moles? Um, guys, it's with us. It's uh, the mole repeller. Uh, if I tell you I've got about six in the garden, it is a very true story. I don't even know if there's one in here. No, because I took it out. Um, the mole repeller, it works. And it works as long as the batteries are charged. Okay, so get yourself one of those little rechargeable battery stations. Um, all we do is we've got... It takes four or six, I think it takes four little batteries, okay, and we just rotate them. Um, and guys, you've got to push this guy, do you see in the drawing here, look, look, look at the drawing, okay. It can't get stuck up there, you can't just stick it into the soil there. It's got to get stuck right up to there, alright. So sometimes if your soil is hard, like in the lawn, guys, you've actually got to like get a, a hammer, and a piece of metal and knock it in and make a hole because don't go bashing this thing with the hammer because you're going to break it. Put the batteries in, push it in, okay? Make sure that it's nice and firm and guys, it vibrates, it sends off a noise that the moles just hate, okay? And then they go to your neighbor. Yeah, the one that doesn't give you leaves know what I'm saying okay right Cindy May do you blow the leaves into the garden good question yes you can you can blow the leaves into the garden and in some areas of the garden we do that uh, we literally blow them straight in and then go up to the plants okay so uh, let's pretend that uh, let's pretend that this is a plant in the garden in a garden bed Okay, let's pretend, and we've blown the leaves, and sometimes the leaves go over here. Then all we do is we just give it a bit of a shake, the leaves fall down, and they form a beautiful mulch. Um, so by all means, yes, you can. But a lot of people say that it looks untidy. Um, I really don't mind that at all. And for me, blowing them into the garden is one way, especially if you've got quite a large garden. Um, so you can move some of the leaves straight onto the garden beds, straight onto the garden beds, and the rest you can then use and recycle as I've shown. But there was another part of her question, which was, oh, 
If you blow them into the garden, how do you stop them from being blown back onto the driveway? Well, that's, um, I think, a question that you need to ask the universe because um, I don't really have the answer to that. But if you've got a blower, um, then you send your youngster out, you send your children out with the blower, and you watch how much fun they have. Excellent. All right. Uh, Janine, what is the best mulch for proteas? Very good question, Janine. Um, you can use your leaf mold, um, 100%. You, you're quite, that is not a problem. You can also, if you can, ideally find some pine needles or some pine bark. Now, if you go into your local builders, go to the section where they've got the piles of compost and ask them for some bark nuggets, okay? Landscaping bark. I actually think we've got some here. Here we go. Decorative bark. This is it. Okay. So this is basically when they sieve the bark, all right, you end up with these chunks. Um, let me open this up so I can actually show you what it looks like. Um, and this is fantastic for those plants that are acid loving. So what are, what are the acid loving plants? Well, yes, your proteas are. Camellias, your hydrangeas, and you can see it's, it's quite chunky. Okay, have a look at that. Beautiful. Um, that pine needles um, works like a charm. Really, really good for your proteas. Remember, guys, whenever you are using a mulch, whenever you are putting down a mulch, um, or whether it's bark chips, don't really worry about the leaves, but anything that's more solid or like compost, do not get it around the neck of the plant. Okay? Do not build it all the way up around the neck because what happens is you could get what we call collar rot because then there's not enough air movement there and the actual bark of the plant will then start rotting. So just keep it away from the actual stem of the plant. Very important. Okay. Goo goo. Um, I'm the lady who planted it bulbs upside down. Oh, goo goo. But it's okay. Um, please to tell you they're growing beautifully the right way up. I told you, goo goo. I told you that gravity is an interesting thing. And even if you plant them upside down, hallelujah, by some miracle of nature, they know where up is. Well done and congratulate. Oh, that's lovely, Goo Goo. Um, Shirley, uh, morning, Tanya from Bryanston. Can one cut back coleus and fuchsias now undercover on the patio? I am going to say yes, because if you are on Bryanston, you don't actually get that cold. You, you, you're almost in a microclimate there. You can get a little bit cold, but you're certainly not going to drop to minus. Um, and if you do prune them back, because they're probably looking a little bit leggy now after the long summer. So give them a pruning and feed them and mulch them and use all those beautiful leaves that you're going to be collecting. I mean, I'm so cuckoo. True story that we've got an avenue down the road here. <laughs> we've got an avenue of trees. And when those leaves fall, I go there with my bucky and I collect leaves because I want to use them to make leaf mold. Um, and why? Because it's amazing and it is free. Okay. Right. Last up, and very importantly, don't forget the wildlife. Um, during winter, the birds need a bit of extra feeding. Yeah, of course they do, you know. Um, don't forget to keep them happy as well. Um, from suet feeders, which is that lovely fatty, which gives them a lot of energy. Um, from suet feeders to seed feeders, there are so many different options, but do consider them um, and always make sure that your water bowls and that your bird baths are clean and full of water because they are going to need it. And whilst we at this, don't forget about your dogs, okay? Because the lawn isn't growing as fast anymore. Um, this is pet grass. Um, you can see, see the label? Um, it's called pet grass, guys, and you can pick it up at your local builders. And we've sewn it in here. And we keep these trays, and we literally just put it outside the front door. And the dogs love it. Uh, they come along, they munch at it. 
uh, they eat it and remember of course there's not much lawn growing so they really do enjoy this um, and finally one thing that I didn't speak about of course is frost protection um, for those of you who are living in the really cold areas there are plants that you're going to want to protect so let's pretend that you have got coleus those tender plants or you have just transplanted some seedlings out okay which are going okay to need some frost protection in the early stages please make sure that you get some frost cover now the frost cover you buy on a roll like this okay nice and easy guys all you do is pop it around your plants and if you want to know the right way to do it and the wrong way to do it ha, we also have an amazing clip on how to get that done guys remember winter is opportunity it's full of beautiful opportunity and probably the best one is on the cover of our may issue which is the beautiful ornamental kale um, this is a cabbage comes in the most amazing colors the most beautiful textures can go to like minus minus degrees and um, the colder it gets the more vivid the colors you can buy them at your local builders and pop them into the garden and of course if we're talking about opportunities it's right here everything that i've been speaking to you about and more is in these magazines cover to cover which is available of course at your local builders and if you're on the more growing your own eating from the garden needing some tips and of course needing some great recipes then you really do need to get your hands on grow to eat magazine full of beautiful recipes full of tips and it takes you right through the winter months so in other words we're going may june july and august is all in here everything is right in this magazine to tell you what to sow when to harvest it how to do it and of course what i can cook with it come on guys everything you need is in those pages remember as well to check out the builders blog okay nice and easy builders.co.za go and have a look there also go onto their youtube channel please guys where you can see loads of great videos educationals and diys to make you a diy hero okay or heroine do we still say that you're just a hero okay folks that's all we've got time for this week the hour has flown i don't even know where it's gone but it's out the window um don't forget winter is the biggest opportunity for us to really make sure that we do the work now and we get the rewards in spring so many things to do not much time so make sure you plan it get out there and do it till the next time when we talk about citrus take care of you and yours and most importantly as always happy gardening